This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Hey friend, this is Rick Renner, and I've been sitting here waiting for you so we can continue our tour of ancient Pergamum. Yesterday, I showed you the Middle District and the gymnasium. Today, we're going to go to the Palestra. I'm going to show you the bathhouses of that region. I'm gonna take you to the Temple of Hera and the Civic Hall, all of the things which gospel preachers would have seen and confronted when they first came to that dark city to preach the gospel. And they did it victoriously. They came in the power of the Holy Spirit and with the power of the Word of God, and they drove back darkness and they established the church in that dark place. And my friends, if it can be done there, it can be done anywhere. And that's why I want you to have the whole series, which is called Take a Tour with Rick Pergamum. Go with me to ancient Pergamum so you can see what the first century believers faced and realize if they can do it, you can do it too. And I also want you to order my book, which is called No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. And this entire book is about what the early believers were facing as the world around them tried to get them to bend and to compromise, but Christ told them not to compromise. And guess what? That's what he's still telling us today. There's no room for compromise. But you can order all these things by going online or by giving us a call. And when you reach out to us, please let us know how to pray for you because we're praying people. And we really believe that when we cry out to God in faith, he hears us and he answers us and he's going to do great things in your life. But you can reach out to us right now and order all these things or let us know how to pray for you by calling or by going online. But today, we're going to have a great time as we continue onward to the ancient city of Pergamum. So let's get started. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. In yesterday's program, I walked you up the stone road all the way to the middle district of Pergamum, where we walked up a winding set of steps onto a long, long terrace. And at one time, that was the location of the gymnasium. Gymnasiums were very famous and very important in the Greek world because that is where young boys and teenagers were educated. And the Greeks believed that physical exercise was a very important part of their education. Also on that long terrace was a temple to Heracles and Hercules. But finally, in between the lower terrace and the upper terrace was a long covered tunnel where men could walk back and forth or runners could run. It was used for those who were running and who were exercising. But eventually, the men that were more serious about their athletics came here. This was the palestra. And in the first century, this was the largest palestra in the Hellenized world, eventually replaced by a larger one in the city of Athens. But let me tell you something about Pergamum. When the Pergamene kings began to build the city of Pergamum, it was their intention to build Pergamum as a mirror of Athens. Athens was the illustrious capital of Greece. This was to be a mirror of that for all of Asia and Asia Minor. But what they built here was simply spectacular. And when they constructed this palestra, they constructed it to be a palace of athletics. Look at it. It's covered by all kinds of columns, and the reliefs on these columns are simply magnificent. The detail is extraordinary. And this was a place for athletic competitions and exercise. But before I tell you more about the palestra, I want to tell you one more important thing about the gymnasium. The word gymnasium comes from the Greek word gumnos. And the word gumnos describes somebody who exercises while they are naked. That's really where the word gymnasium comes from. And you see in the Greek and Roman world, when young boys and teenagers entered into the gymnasium to exercise, they removed every stitch of clothing. If you had walked into the gymnasium or into this palestra, you wouldn't have seen any men dressed at all. They were all completely naked. They were in the nude as they were fighting and training and exercising. 
You might say, well, why in the world were they naked? Because they didn't want anything to restrict their movements. They wanted complete freedom of movement so they could freely exercise. Or when they came into the place room, they were disrobing as they came, and it was a mental statement. I'm removing everything that could hinder me so I can give myself fully to the fight. Well, guess what? When you read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says to Timothy, but refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. That word exercise comes from this word gumno, gumnadzo, which means, hey, Timothy, you need to throw off all laziness. You need to throw off anything that could hinder you and make a mental decision. You're going to strip of anything that could hinder your development and throw yourself into exercise and you're to exercise yourself unto godliness. The reason Paul would use that illustration is because the entire Greek and Roman world knew that these guys who trained in the gymnasium and in the palaestra disrobed as a statement that they were going to give themselves fully to development. And Paul says, if you're really gonna develop godliness in your life, then you're gonna to have to strip of a lot of things and really give yourself to it. Now, I wanna tell you about this palaestra. That's where I am. This is the palaestra on the middle terrace in the ancient city of Pergamum. The word palaestra is a derivative of the word poly, the word poly is an old Greek word which means combat. It describes a struggle. But when the word poly becomes the word palestra, it describes a house of combat sports. That's what this was. This was not a place for any mere athlete. This was a house of combat sports. In any palestra, there were primarily three sports that were fought. Number one was wrestling. Number two was boxing. And number three was a horrific sport, which was called pancration. These were terrible, terrible sports. For example, wrestlers were not mere wrestlers like people wrestle today. Boxers were not mere boxers like people who box today. And in the world today, we don't even have a sport to match pancration. These were brutal, brutal sports. But guess what? This word pale, where we get the word palestra, which is what describes this place where I am, is also found in the Bible. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, where the Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. In verse 12, when Paul says, For we wrestle, it is the word pale, where we get the word palestra, that's where I am. Which means Paul was telling us that we better be prepared because when we enter into spiritual conflict, it's not just a little fight, it can be a very brutal fight. The enemy gives everything he can to destroy people. And if you've not done your part to strip and exercise and prepare, then you may not be fit for the battle. And when Paul says we wrestle, it really is a charge to us, alerting us to the fact that when you enter into a fight with the enemy, it can be a back snapping, eye gouging, back breaking event. And therefore we have to enter into it ready to really fight to the end. The most celebrated of all the combat sports were boxing, wrestling, and pancration. And the celebrity status of the fierce committed fighters who participated in these combat sports well, they were celebrated widespread throughout the entire Roman Empire in the first century. Wrestling was the most ancient of the three main combat sports and the most popular among the ancient Greeks. Because wrestling was an essential part of the education of Roman boys in the wealthier classes, nearly every adult male had to develop a taste for wrestling. Competitions were conducted in the nude and very few rules applied. For instance, some of the most violent fighting techniques were allowed in wrestling, like blows, kicks, thrusts, throttle holes, twisting of the joints, fighting on the ground. Boxing was the most popular of the combat sports among Romans. As the appetite for violence and bloodshed grew among the masses of the Roman Empire, gloves were developed to deliver a more painful punch. Eventually, Gloves with metal spikes were allowed to make the fights bloodier and more gruesome. Boxing was truly a brutal sport 
that could prove deadly. And there were no weight divisions, no rounds, few rules, and the fights generally ended when one of the boxers was too severely wounded to continue. The third combat sport was Pancration, an extremely savage and dangerous sport that had almost no rules and accepted nearly every tactic imaginable. Competitors hit, slapped, kicked, shoved, bit, and broke or dislocated the bones of their opponents. And like boxing, Pancration could prove to be deadly. Only members of the wealthy class could participate in these kinds of professional athletics because they were the only ones that had enough money and time to devote themselves to full-time sports. But teachers and philosophers frequently ventured into Greek and Roman gymnasiums and palestras for the purpose of influencing young men being groomed for leadership. As a focal point for social life in the city's middle district, the palestra was joined to other structures that were vital to the daily activities of Pergamon's middle and upper classes, including the city's exclusive bathhouses and key sites like the Temple of Hera, the Civic Hall, which seated about 800 people, the massive Temple of Demeter, and a small temple of Asclepios. On the middle terrace where the palestra was located, there were two very large bathhouses. One had eight rooms, another was more exclusive, and it had six rooms. But I'm sitting in the undressing room of the bigger one, and this room was really important. As I've told you, you couldn't compete in the gymnasium or in the palestra unless you had stripped of every stitch of clothing. The people who went there to train and to compete didn't want anything to hinder their movement. And this was the undressing room. But something else really important happened in this room to athletes who were the most serious. In this room, they laid on a table where their trainer came and applied oil to their entire bodies. He poured it all over them, massaged it into them in order to make them slippery so that even if their opponent grabbed them, their opponent could not hold on to them. It makes me think of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When the anointing of the Holy Spirit's working in our life, even if the devil grabs hold of us, he can't hold on to us because the anointing enables us to slip right out of his embrace. The Pergamum's middle district had two large bath complexes located on either side of the palestra. One had six large rooms and most likely was a more private bathhouse that accommodated the wealthier citizens of Pergamum who gathered for afternoons of cleansing, relaxation, and physical gratification. This smaller bathhouse was located at the west end of the palestra. But where I am was the larger bathhouse in the middle district. It had eight large rooms and could accommodate many more people than the bathhouse adjacent to the west end of the palestra. Its spacious design included a large room crowned with a vaulted ceiling that was lined with marble of various colors and had a floor covered with mosaics. And one big room held a statue of the emperor and was used as a shrine for emperor worship. Public bathhouses were open to every social class throughout the Roman Empire, but it's likely the middle and upper class who lived in this prestigious district of Pergamum were the primary clients of this particular bathhouse. But typical Roman bathhouses were constructed with three primary sections, the Frigidarian for cold baths, the Tipidarian for warm baths, and the Caldarian for hot baths. These bathhouses were very technologically advanced. For example, the walls were veneered with marble, but behind the marble, there was space for heat to come up between the walls, so the entire room was warm. The floors were supported, and under the floors was heat. They were very, very advanced. Floors were covered with mosaics, walls were decorated with relief sculptures, and massive columns in the center of the main room supported the arched roof of the central Frigidarium. 
Bathhouses were simply palaces of indulgence, where people from all walks of life mingled and where the upper class gathered for leisurely afternoons. They even had libraries, gardens, statues and fountains, and private chambers were also available where clients requested sexual services for a fee. But every person who went to a bathhouse was not decadent. But promiscuous and deviant sexual activity was so common in Roman society by the first century that it wasn't even perceived as unusual. It was a testament to the extent to which the pagan world had sunk morally by that time. We know that early Christians used the bathhouses, but they didn't linger here very long because of the activities that took place here. They understood that God had given them the charge to flee from idolatry and fornication, and these were places of idolatry and fornication. So they came in, got clean, and they left because these were places where people were susceptible to temptation. On the eastern end of the palaestra, right next to the big bathhouse, was the temple of Hera. You say, who is Hera? Hera was the female goddess who was married to Zeus. Zeus and Hera were husband and wife, according to mythology. You know, you may ask, where in the world did they get all of these gods and all of this mythology? Well, I'm going to answer that question in the next program, and you don't want to miss it. Hera was viewed as the perfection of everything admirable in a woman and became the chief symbol of femininity. The Temple of Hera in the Middle District of Pergamum had a portico with columns lining the front and a large stairway with large marble door columns on each side. It's believed that within the temple's inner chamber stood idols depicting Zeus and Hera, but there were also idols of other gods. Animals were sacrificed at the altar near the entrance to the temple of Hera, and then choice parts of the sacrifice were carried into the inner sanctuary where they were burned on blazing fires. But these rituals were commonplace in temples to Hera throughout the Roman Empire. I'm seated on old Andesite Hellenistic stones on the north side of the palaestra. And from where I'm seated, I can look out at this magnificent palaestra with columns that were fashioned of marble and the capitals are simply breathtaking. How in the world did they carve such amazing capitals from stone without modern machinery? I don't know, it is just amazing. But 2,000 years ago, when gospel preachers first came to the city of Pergamum to plant a church, it's also true that senators and councilmen would have been walking on these terraces among all of these covered colonnades, and eventually they would have wandered into this place, which was called the Bulletarian. It's from the Greek word bulomai, which means I counsel. So a bulletarian was a place filled with city councilmen. This is where all the local government meant to devise policies and to make regulations for the city and for the citizens of Pergamum. But you have to understand, this was also a place where a lot of sacrifices were made to the gods and incense was burned to the emperor. And that is the reason why connected to it was an arch leading to multiple kitchens where rituals and occult meals were prepared. You have to remember that Pergamum was the capital of the province and the pro-council lived here. And one of the pro-council's primary responsibilities was to enforce emperor worship. And that's why statues of the emperor were positioned all over the city, including bathhouses, streets, temples. And here, before they began their city council meetings, they would have started their proceedings by burning incense to the emperor and making a sacrifice to the gods. You know, Jesus referred to the city of Pergamum as the seat of Satan in Revelation chapter 2. And in a very real way, the entire mountaintop of the city was a great altar. Smoke billowed into the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as pagans made sacrifices to the gods. And before the councilmen commenced their meetings in this place, they would have begun 
by offering a sacrifice to the gods and burning incense to the current ruling emperor. Originally, the Budlamai seated about 800 people at a time, but eventually it was converted into an Odeon, which was a concert hall to hold musical, theatrical, and dramatic performances for those who lived in the wealthier districts of Pergamum. To be honest, most times when we come to do work here in the city of Pergamum, we don't come here because we come in greener times of the year. And during greener times of the year, this place is filled with snakes. In fact, all these ancient sites are filled with snakes. One of my crew members just a few days ago stepped on a big snake in the stadium of Ephesus. But if a visitor visiting the region didn't take the main road to the top of the Acropolis, he would have taken a very steep set of steps that led up this hill to the temple of Asclepius and to the temple of Demeter. Pergamum was possibly the darkest pagan city in the first century when gospel preachers first arrived there. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, they penetrated that spiritual darkness, and the church was born in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the series, Take a Tour with Rick, Pergamum, Rick Renner walks you through the entire site of Pergamum. With permission from local authorities, every door was open to Rick and his film crew to give you the most in-depth and all-inclusive tour of this once formidable city. This is truly a one-of-a-kind tour of Pergamum, and you'll join Rick as he walks you step-by-step step through each site and teaches you all along the way. Rick says, if the Christians in Pergamum could stay true to their faith in the darkness they lived in, then we can do it too. This 10-part documentary-style series is available in digital or physical format, starting at just $20. We're also offering the book, No Room for Compromise, a full-color, beautifully illustrated, hardbound book that will captivate you and your family for years to come. On every page, Rick reveals the realities that early believers faced as the church began to flourish in a dark pagan world. With unsurpassed detail, fascinating insights, and historical context, you'll have a greater appreciation and understanding of Scripture and how you should interpret it for today. No Room for Compromise is available for just $80. Don't miss this special offer. The illuminating series, Take a Tour with Rick, Pergamum, and the book, No Room for Compromise. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and today I'm standing in the big studio in our new building in Moscow. You helped us build this building. Behind me is the big fireplace. It's covered. That's really the focus of the new studio. There's going to be library shelves and so many wonderful things, and I'm going to be sitting right here teaching the Bible verse by verse, diving into the Greek New Testament to bring teaching that people can trust to the ends of the world. And when I tell you the ends of the world, I really mean that. People are reaching out to us from the farthest ends of the world saying thank you for bringing this teaching right to where we are. And my friends, you're a big part of this because you're a partner. You helped build this building and I want to say thank you to you. I've told you before, it's not about buildings. You just have to have the space so you can create programming. And in just a few weeks, my team is going to move into the second floor of this building while they continue to finish the first floor of the building. It's pretty exciting. But thank you so much for helping us. We really do what we say we're going to do, so here it is. And at the same time, we've been retiring the debt on the big Tulsa facility. That facility is so wonderful. And from that office in Tulsa, we are ministering to the needs of our partners. Partner ministry is not secondary to us. It is first place. We really mean it when we call people partners. And in that Tulsa facility, we're taking calls, making calls, touching lives, and strengthening people who need to be strengthened. That's God's mandate to us to strengthen those that are weak and those who need to be stronger. And we're reaching out by faith and through various means to touch people. And what a pleasure it is. It's really an honor to have partners. And that means you. Thank you for being a partner. And right now, we're paying off that Tulsa facility and a lot of it has already been paid off. That's miraculous. 
but it's been possible because of the grace of God, the favor of God, and because of your faithful and generous giving. And I want to say thank you on behalf of me and Denise and our sons, our family, and our ministry team for the way that you've joined hands with us to help retire the debt on that building. My friends, when that building is paid off, it will suddenly release a flood of finances so we can take the teaching of the Bible even further to the ends of the earth. And that's God's call to us. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many. And that's our task, to feed many the Word of God. And today I want to thank you for what you've done to help us build this facility and to pay off the Tulsa building. And together, we can get this done. Well, how are you enjoying our tour of ancient Pergamum? Would you please call or write and let me know how you're enjoying this tour? We really worked hard to prepare this for you, and we're praying that it's a blessing to you. But I want you to order the entire series, which is called Take a Tour with Rick, Pergamum. Many people ask me to take them on a tour of these ancient sites, and I can't. So we decided to bring the tour to you. And my friends, I want you to have it. And you can order this by going online or by giving us a call right now. And I also want you to have my book, which is based on Christ's message to the church in Pergamum in Revelation chapter 2. The book is called No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. That's what he was saying to the church of Pergamum, and that's what he's still saying to us today. Jesus' message to the church of Pergamum is very relevant for us because we're living in an age when the world is calling on us to bend, to forfeit our faith, and to compromise. But Jesus told them, and Jesus is still telling us there's no room for compromise. And my friend, this book will really encourage you. And it's like an encyclopedia about life in the first century, what believers were dealing with and what they had to do to walk in victory. And it will help you as well. You can also order this by going online or by giving us a call. And when you reach out to us, please let us know how to pray for you. And I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you that you've called us not to compromise. And thank you, Father, that we can make the decision to faithfully follow Jesus and not bend to the spirit of the age. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'll see you tomorrow. But until then, please remember Ecclesiastes 8, for where the word of a king is, there's power. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.